This is Sammy Morris uh, interviewing Tim Sands, the Purdue University Provost, for the Library's Oral History Program. The date is February 12, 2014. Tim, thank you so much for agreeing to join me today. My pleasure. Um, I know that you're very busy, and I'm going to keep my questions somewhat short, but we do like to get a little bit of background on each interviewee because sometimes there are people with common names, and it just helps researchers in mm -hmm. the future. So if, could you just briefly tell me where you grew up and went to high school? Uh, I grew up in Hayward, California, and I went to Sunset High School. Okay. So I know that um, after getting your bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees, you worked in at UC Berkeley, where you also received your degrees, correct? Uh, I actually went, after I received my PhD from Berkeley, I went to uh, work for Bell Communications Research. And I was with them for nine years, but the first two years they left me out in Berkeley at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as an industry fellow. Then I spent seven years in New Jersey before I returned to, to Berkeley as a professor. Okay, okay. Yes, I had that there. I just skipped ahead for some reason. Um, the, at some point around 2001, I was reading that you had made a visit to Purdue and you were impressed with the plans for the Discovery Park. Mm -hmm. that's, Could that's you tell correct. me a little bit about the first time you encountered Purdue? Was it on that trip or had you been familiar with it before just from being in another university? Or I made one trip earlier and I can't, I could find the date if I looked hard in my CV because I know I, I gave an, a, a talk at, uh, I think it was in materials engineering. Oh. Um, and that might have been about five or ten years before, so probably in the, in the mid 90s um, I came out and it was the, my first trip to Purdue um, I do remember walking down Northwestern Avenue. It was 17 degrees. And as a Californian, my ears were frozen. I thought I was going to uh, have parts falling off. And, goodness. But, uh, but um, and yet I came back. That's you know? what I was yeah. just thinking. Yeah. Somehow we persuaded you. Well, um, that was my next question was, I know that you, you worked as a professor at Berkeley until 2002. Could you tell me a little bit about your journey from there to Purdue, how you decided mm -hmm. to leave, and what attracted you either to Purdue or the Midwest? Sure. I, I, we were um, living in California, but on sabbatical with the entire family in Belgium from about December of 2000 to July of 2001. And uh, while I was in Belgium, Purdue called. Now, they had contacted me earlier and said that there was a position they wanted to talk to me about, but I, I, I kind of put them off. I said, I'm going on sabbatical. I really don't want to worry about that right now. Mm -hmm. And But some part, I can't remember exactly when, but sometime in the spring of 2001, I got a, a more um, insistent message from Purdue saying that they really needed me out there. Uh, they wanted to talk to me about um, the position that was open, which was the Basil Turner chair, which is split between electrical engineering and materials engineering. And a very unusual chair. Uh, Arden Bement was the previous um, occupant of that chair. In fact, I had met, Arden was one of the people I met in my first visit to Purdue. I remember that vividly because he was a professor and he was, I think, before he moved over to run, uh, to become head of nuclear engineering. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, the Basil Turner chair was what they were recruiting for and uh, it was a, a nice setup. I, I was impressed with it, but I didn't have any interest in it at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Belgium, they, they were so insistent that I, okay, well, I'll, uh, this is my only trip out of um, Europe for this six months will be a one or two day trip to, um, to West Lafayette. But they were that insistent somehow. I, I don't remember how they got me to do that, but did it anyway. And uh, I was thoroughly impressed with the, the collaborative spirit of the faculty. I, got, mm -hmm. I remember meeting with the ECE, Electrical and Computer Engineering faculty in nanotechnology um, and uh, being extremely impressed. I'd heard of them but I hadn't met them, I hadn't worked with them, except for maybe one. Um, and then I, the same thing in materials engineering, there were, there were a number of people I didn't know them well, but I'd met one or two. Mm -hmm. And I was just very impressed when I, when I had a chance to talk with them. But probably the, the thing that really put it over the top and made it something that I took seriously was uh, sitting down and hearing about the plans for Discovery Park and that they had, a lot of the money was already in place. They had a commitment from Lilly, they had, um, a very uh, large gift from Michael Burke uh, for the Nanotechnology Center. So it wasn't just a, f a pipe dream, it was something that was well along mm -hmm. in terms of funding and, and the plans. 
And the reason I liked it is that they were going to build a nanotechnology center that had all of the disciplines together because nanotechnology cuts across many disciplines. At Purdue, at least a dozen. And uh, the reason I like that is that uh, when I was at Bell Communications Research, that's the way we operated. We had the chemists, the physicists, the you know everybody was in the same melting pot. We kind of mm-hmm. worked together. We were elbow to elbow. We shared everything. And it was just a kind of a magic place from the standpoint of research uh, productivity, very lively. Every, every um, There was a discovery every day, it seemed like. And the, wow. the quality of the work was really high. And I missed that. Berkeley was a great place. Um, it still is, mm-hmm. but it was... Um, uh, siloed like most universities yes. every discipline had its own building and even though the, even though the, the weather's good and the buildings aren't that far apart you just don't get that kind of mixing right. the, the intent was there they just didn't have the facilities and uh, uh, so when I um, saw this plan I thought well now that's interesting mm-hmm. so I went back and I remember flew back uh, immediately I think it was I literally was here 24 hours I think Flew back to Belgium, and I remember walking around a lake in Belgium with with my family, or uh, talking about Purdue and think, you know, this is something that is pretty serious here. This isn't uh, uh, just a, something I did for some friends to go entertain them. I, I uh, uh, think we ought to look at this, mm-hmm. and so we started thinking about it. And it took a long time to think it through. I'm trying to remember. We we came here in the fall of. Uh, 2002, and we didn't make a decision until I think m- May, June of 2002. Okay. So here, this was 2001, the spring that that I was having this conversation with my family. What happened is after we came back, we started thinking about it, and my wife was uh, working at UC San Francisco. She was mm-hmm. a, a faculty member in the th- division of geriatrics there, and she's a PhD, not an MD. So she mm-hmm. it wasn't the permanent setup. It was something she was teaching re- fellows after the MD, they, they uh, oh, become a fellow and uh, she was um, uh, doing a lot of research and so it was flexible hours wise but it wasn't a long term thing and she was this three hour commute, an hour and a half there, hour and a half back. We had four little kids. We were struggling with the public schools in California. Eventually every one of them ended up in a small private school. <clears throat> and. Uh, I was quite happy with my position at Berkeley, but but that was it was also I was felt like I was missing this uh, interdisciplinary nature. Although I mm-hmm. most of my collaborations were outside the department, but it just it wasn't uh, resourced in a way that and you know, I wasn't hanging out with people with different uh, um, discipline, different disciplines. So um, all those things together made us start to really think as a family: is this something we want to do? Um, it was hard because our daughter, oldest daughter, was a freshman in high school, oh, yes. and um, she had been to two high schools already, and this would have been three, and mm-hmm. we, you know, she was really kind of struggling with whether this made sense. But when we added it all up, we just kind of, I remember we, we took our first trip to Yosemite. Here, we're native Californians. My wife and I are native Californians. Mm-hmm. We had never been to Yosemite. Wow. So on our way out, we took our first trip to Yosemite. That was pretty much when we were hiking around Yosemite when we decided, okay, let's let's do this. And um, you know, came back. I think it must have been. It was in the summer of 2002. Um, and uh, we just said, okay, we're going to the Midwest. And the kids, uh, I remember they, we thought they would fight us because they're they grew up in California and New Jersey. They've been on coasts and uh, they had this time in Belgium. Didn't think they would be too excited about coming to the Midwest, where, you know, who knows what what was out there. Exactly. And uh, but they they realized. I remember one of our kids asked, "Does this mean we're going to be able to spend more time with you?" And uh, we hadn't thought about it that way, but we said, "Yes, absolutely. We're oh. we're cutting off so many hours of the day mm-hmm. from the commute. Uh, we have a good good public schools here in West Lafayette. It will it will um, yes every a lot of these problems we've been having will be solved and and sure enough uh, wow. and they 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 really have enjoyed it. They all have gone to Purdue and uh, will have five Purdue degrees when they're done between them and Amazing. it's uh, yeah no we, we feel very fortunate that all, that all worked out. So no regrets. It was the right move. Terrific. Well, when you were when you were being uh, brought into Purdue and obviously um, people at Purdue had heard of you. Um, do you know at that time were they kind of planning for you to take on the nanotechnology center whenever it was ready? No, no. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I think they thought of me as a one of their 
senior recruits mm -hmm. and uh, that as an anchor sort of for the for the faculty in the center I see. among others you know I would but mm -hmm. someone they brought in from the outside um, I became involved in the the cluster hiring at that point uh, Mark Lundstrom and I he's a faculty member in ECE he and I were co-chairs and we had I think uh, Vlad Shalev was and Andy Weiner were part of it as well we had a, a large committee that and we, we hired um, I think all total something like 25 faculty through that committee wow. over a period of years mm -hmm. and um, uh, so we built up the faculty and, and it was a mix about half of the faculty were Purdue faculty who move into the center mm -hmm. and the other half were recruited from the outside I and see. so we had a very nice nice mix from all over the world um, another thing I liked about this the center was that that kind of diversity of experience and ideas and yeah sure absolutely. so um, no I didn't uh, plan on becoming the uh, Burke Center director matter of fact I, I would, if they told me I had to do that I probably would have said I don't want to even come because I had just had a bit of a um, conversation with the Dean of Engineering at Berkeley they had insisted that I be the department chair mm -hmm. um, of material science and engineering it was my turn and, and they, they were right. It was a little early in my career to do that, but mm -hmm. I, it, it wasn't an unrealistic expectation. But I thought there were others who could have done a better job of it, given mm -hmm. their position and longstanding um, connections with both the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and, and the campus. So I, and I didn't really want to do it, to be honest, at that mm -hmm. stage of my career. So mm -hmm. I basically said, I don't want to do it. I, I wrote a long letter explaining who should do it and why, and uh, the, the dean at the time... Uh, uh, late Richard Newton um, uh, de declined my offer not to do it, <laughs> and uh, and I said, well, I've got this other offer at at Purdue, and I'm, I'm seriously thinking about it. And um, in in the end, uh, I decided to accept the Purdue offer. I told him, and then you know that we started the discussion about retention. I said, I didn't want to. Uh, I made a decision. I really don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But he did. He did go through some motions for me. It was, it was very nice. Uh, but it, in the end, I decided to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so when I became, I came here in 2002, it was 2006 when I became um, director of the Burke Center. And the, the way that happened is I was on the search committee and the, they were, re we were reviewing candidates and at some point the chair of the search committee, that was uh, Richard Schwartz, the former dean of College of Engineering, Dick Schwartz, um, he said, uh, you need to resign from the search committee and I want you to be a candidate. And so I thought, well, that's um, interesting. So I went home and talked to my family and because they, had, they weren't too keen on me be doing an administrative job. They really didn't. Mm -hmm. They were not happy about the idea of me doing it at Berkeley. And so I thought, well, I better ask. And th they came back and said, yeah, this is different. This is, um, sounds more like what you, you would enjoy. So yeah. they supported me in doing it. And um, I remember interviewing and going through the process and ended up becoming the Burke director in November of 2006. I see. Well, whenever you came to Purdue first as the um, Basil Turner Professor of Engineering, how much of your workload was teaching versus research? Mm -hmm. Was it kind of when an I, even split? Or? When I first came in, I think it was an even split. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was teaching um, mostly graduate students or 500 series where seniors and undergrads and graduate students Mm -hmm. uh, I had some 600 level courses and I taught an occasional course at the undergraduate level. Um, not, not a heavy teaching load, little more than one full course per semester. Okay. Um, but I did have a lot of research going on there. I had 13 PhD students uh, at the peak, I think, and quite a bit of research uh, money, many grants at one time, a lot of administration there. Uh, but that that was a great time from after I got settled in here, I had a couple of years to really um, focus on research and and developing some new courses for Purdue. Oh, that's great. And so it was it was a great time. Um, becoming Burke director then a few years later meant that I had to um, set aside time to be the director of the center, mm -hmm. which to be per perfectly honest, wasn't all that much. I think it might have been 50% of my effort or 70%, but it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't 100%. And uh, I still kept my research group. It became a little smaller, more like seven or eight PhD students. And um, 
that I was able to, after a couple of years, find a balance there. Well, the main reason I asked was, um, I saw on your Vita that you had received a teaching award at Berkeley, and I was curious about what your preference would have been in terms of how much of your time would go to each, and then once you started to transition into more leadership roles, mm -hmm. was that what was that like for you to kind of need to focus more of your time in that area as opposed to the traditional teaching and research, mm -hmm. which I know you did keep up a lot of your research, but clearly a lot of your time was being pulled for the mm -hmm. administrative as well. Yeah, I think the, the Burke director thing was a little administration light in the sense that you know, my main role was to solve an occasional problem that came up and to in try to inspire people mainly to work together. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the main effort. We had uh, put, I put a lot of effort into showing, demonstrating that the Burke Nanotechnology Center, this concept of having an inter interdisciplinary research center where people actually reside in the, in the building, they don't just visit it, that, mm -hmm. that, that the connections between the people created research opportunities that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And, so if you go in the center and you walk in the front door and look to the right, there's a there's a map of the research interactions uh, for each year of the Burke Center, and you can see them grow between research wow. groups. And that was really what I was in it for, was mm -hmm. this is exciting, multidisciplinary work, and, and let's uh, see if we can lower all the barriers to uh, collaborating. And so, you know, it, it wasn't that it took that much time. That was more um, effort. Uh, or more thinking and working with people it wasn't and communicating it wasn't I wasn't sitting behind a desk cranking numbers all the time it was or right. or filling up because the center director doesn't have you know I had staff I was resp responsible for there were I think almost 30 people um, outside the faculty mm -hmm. but I didn't have to do reviews of faculty or what have you because they they didn't have appointments in the center their appointments were back in the department oh, so okay. it, it was um, so I could spend you know all, I'd say the majority of my time teaching and doing research. I taught every other semester or, um, a regular class, and then I, um, I, you know, maintain an active research group. But it, I had to throttle both of those back from what they were before. Yeah. Uh, but I, I didn't. I think the first really demanding administrative job I had was this one was provost. Well, I know that must have been quite a, a transition, and that actually was my next question. Um, so you were appointed provost and VP for academic affairs in 2010. And could you tell me a little bit about what that transition was like for you? Yeah, that was, um, you know, you mentioned about keeping up research and teaching. One thing I, I liked about the Burke Center directorship is that I, I thought I would do it for five years and I could see the, the end of that and I was gonna go back to being a regular faculty member. So that's mm -hmm. one reason I kept up both research and teaching. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and kept it up at a decent pace. Uh, about four years, three, well, three and a half years in or so, I remember Al Rebar, who is executive director, is still the executive director at Discovery Park, um, told me that it was, uh, it was going to be time in a few months for my fifth year review for the beginning of that process. Mm -hmm. And I remember either thinking or telling him directly, I probably did both, well, no, don't bother because I'm only doing this for five years. This is, oh, this okay. is uh, I don't, I wanna go back. And partway through that, uh, let's see, it would have been four years in, um, I was asked to apply for the provost position. And that was, that, that's a whole, that's a game changer. That's when I knew that, oh, if I do this, this is um, going to be hard to keep my, my research and teaching up. Um, and it may be a permanent decision. And that was a, I don't think I've really come to grips with that. Maybe I'm barely now coming to grips with that. Right. But, uh, but it, because I still have a couple of grad students and, you know, still once a week I, I head over at 4.30 and spend two hours with them. Uh, it's not quite the same, but, mm -hmm. but, but it uh, keeps my, my brain in it occasionally. I have a place to take a mental vacation and, yes. and go back to research. <laughs> but well, I noticed that on your resume. I was impressed with that because it is, it's something that clearly you've made a priority to fit that in to your schedule. Well, yeah, and I, I still, um, I, like I said, I, I, even in the provost position, I was thinking, well, I might just do that for three years and then go back. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, that was always in the back of my, my head, um, that this wouldn't be something I would do for, for a long time. And so if, if you think about that, if you're a faculty member, then you need to keep your research up. Absolutely. Even your, and your teaching too, you need to keep something uh, a thread of that going through or else coming back is going to be really tough oh, yes. and th that's one of the reasons I kept it going besides the fact that I enjoyed it 
But um, yeah, when I became provost at, I had to rethink it. I remember talking to Leah Jamison, the dean mm -hmm. of engineering, because my faculty appointments are in engineering, you know, about, well, let me hang on here and continue to do this stuff, this, be, a, be a professor for part of this experience. And I did that for, th I said, I'll, t I'll tell you in three years where, where, where my thinking is. And three years came up and I sat down with the dean and said, I'm not really quite ready to, <laughs> to, yeah. to pull the plug on this. And, and we talked about it a little. Shortly after, I ended up um, as, uh, um, I guess that would, that would have been, well, I guess that was when I started realizing that I was leaving and taking this Virginia mm -hmm. Tech. Well, I don't know that I knew what position I was going to be taking, but I, I realized that I was probably going to be moving on. Uh, but um, that that was a hard decision to um, and one that I've not really made <laughs> I bet I mean that is yeah. a, a it's another life-changing one like mm -hmm. coming to Purdue well just backtracking just a little bit I was fascinated when you said that they approached you about becoming provost what was your initial response to that what, did that take you by surprise or oh well uh, yes I think mean, what happened actually backing up a little when the provost position was posted and uh, Randy Woodson had given notice that he was going to be chancellor of North Carolina State and mm -hmm. you know so we people were scrambling to to uh, start a search Franz Cordova decided that it would be a uh, internal candidate partly because it was halfway through her um, contract right. and the strategic plan that she helped develop was just um, coming into play and people were buying into it and it was it was moving and mm -hmm. she didn't want to have an external candidate coming in she also felt like, um, and I found this out later, that she didn't really want a dean in that position because she felt it was important that the provost help her make a direct connection to the faculty. So mm -hmm. she wanted someone who had a little closer to the faculty role. Mm -hmm. And um, but what really what happened on my end, that all I learned later. But what happened on my end is I was sitting in my office at the Burke Center, and um, one of my collaborators and Burke faculty member Tim Fisher came into my office, and he said, "You." You've got a fish or cut bait. And Tim is someone who always has given me um, straight up advice, mm -hmm. and and you know often I don't take it, but I do sometimes. <laughs> and he came to me and said that, and I, I remember thinking, "What are you talking about?" Um, mm -hmm. He said, "Well, the provost position's open, so you're either going to do it or not. You know, don't don't dawdle, don't don't mull it over, just jump or not." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, I, this is the first time I've even thought about it." Uh, and why would I be a candidate for it? And then I started to look into it, and I, oh, I see, they're doing internal search. Because I had paid no, no attention to it. I still wasn't, I had, I, you know, I didn't decide to fish or cut bait at that point. I didn't mm -hmm. think about it too hard. But I did get a call, and I can't remember, I think it was uh, Rick Kozier, who was head of the search committee, at some point called me and said, or contacted me and said, we want you to be, um, to apply. We want you. And I said, well, uh, I don't think it's a good idea. It just doesn't really, that's not me. You know, I, I, what, why would I be a provost? And um, well, we talked about it, and, and the more that I heard about it, the more I thought, well, it's not a crazy idea. Um, I agreed to, and I think the president called me even at one point and said, you know, you really need to apply. So I agreed to not apply, but to, um, to meet with the search committee. I said, well, I'll do that. And we'll see how it goes. And uh, if that goes well, then maybe I'll apply. And I had a meeting with the search committee, and I guess it went well enough to, you know, I to be honest, I didn't really prepare for it. So whatever I did didn't tank my mm -hmm. candidacy, and they insisted I do it. At some point, I decided. I remember thinking, okay, well, I will. You're going They made me a finalist. I think even before I really formally applied. <laughs> but then, um, and there were two colleagues who were also being arm twisted into this too, oh, uh -huh. and uh, which is normally what you have to do. Usually, it's people who, when you become a provost, usually you've been dragged and kicking yes. and screaming. Um, but there were a couple things that that happened. One is that um, started to talk about it at home because every Sunday our kids would come home from Purdue mm -hmm. and have dinner with us and you know they would tell us what was working what wasn't at Purdue and since I, w I didn't have a deep um, engagement with the undergrads or the freshmen at that time because I was in the Burke Center right. it's mostly graduate students and research um, I wouldn't have normally thought that being provost which really encompasses 
the undergraduate programs mm -hmm. as well as the graduate um, would be a little bit of a strange thing for me to do, but they kept telling me, oh, this is working, this isn't, and we kept, we had the recession, and it was clear that we were at a fork in the road as an institution, so it sounded like a really interesting grand challenge problem to be a provost of a major university at that moment. Right. So that got my, my, piqued my interest a little bit, but um, when it was time to act out being a finalist, the main activity was a public forum oh, and uh, okay. when I was announced as a finalist they told me that the public forum was in one week wow. and uh, so I um, everybody knew that and I kind of closed my door of my um, office in Burke expecting to be interrupted I wasn't no one bothered me for I think I had three solid days oh. where no one bothered me and I just thought about what because I thought okay this is great I've got a forum where I can say whatever I want to the university and yeah, I don't really care if I don't get the position, so I might as well just say what I think. And mm -hmm. I did that, and that was probably the best ticket to get the position because it, I came across as not really, I didn't really want, well, I didn't really want it. I, you know, it wasn't something I was seeking, but I just thought this is a great opportunity. So yeah, advice I give to someone who really wants a job is to pretend you don't want it Right. And just speak your mind because if people want to hear the honesty, they don't want to hear your plan for getting their vote. You, they yes. want to hear what you think the issues are. And so I, I did that um, and uh, ended up uh, as provost a few days later. I think it was very quick. Amazing. So did they give you any framework for the topic that you were going to cover in the forum? Or was it all up to you? Or? I don't think so. I, I don't remember that. Um, I remember... Uh, thinking through what I wanted to say, and it had to do with a long, long-term planning, and really, how do we deal with this funding crisis that we're in? And uh, and we talked a little bit about um, having a ten or twenty-year perspective on where the university's going, rather than doing a two-year by two-year, which is what we typically did. Not that any, no one was looking out that far; clearly, mm -hmm. people had, but um, there wasn't a regular planning exercise at that kind of 10-year level mm -hmm. and there were some big opportunities there and some big challenges and I was looking forward to that that part of it um, and I talked a little bit about who I was you know what my experience was I remember I had a like a PowerPoint map of me bouncing across the US <laughs> you know uh, but um, it was it was a very fun it was a fun experience and I remember thinking oh that was great it was good fun and I wasn't too serious about it but the, I do also remember coming home and talking to my wife, and she's a faculty member here, mm -hmm. and you know, kind of realizing that if this, in, in, if we end up doing this, this is going to have a big impact on her career, mm -hmm. and she's going to have to um, be part of it somehow. And mm -hmm. and we started talking about that, but we didn't get too far along before I got the phone call that I was going to be provost. They wanted me on a plane, that I think within a couple of days to fly out to Mollenkopf to the to oh, the yes. Naples event. Uh -huh. So that would have been February of 2010. And um, my official start date was April 1st because that was when um, Randy was leaving. Oh, so uh -huh. we, we got in a few weeks of overlap. I kind of job shadowed him for a little while. Um, you know, when I think back on how little I knew at that point about the provost's role, um, I'm shocked that that I've survived it, but it was, I, you know, I, I went into it think, thinking I'll figure it out as we go, and Randy was great, but we didn't have much time to overlap. Right. So a lot of the, everything I saw seemed new, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but one by one we sort of figured it out, and we had some struggles, but it was, it was good, um, and it was, it was, as I thought, uh, uh, a big deal for my family, because I, I was going to be doing the nights and weekends thing for the university for especially certain months of the year, um, certainly football season, and then times in the spring when mm -hmm. my calendar was just completely dense and we'd be traveling together. Um, Laura got involved in the, I would say, the friend raising for the university. Oh, yes. And uh -huh. uh, she kept her full-time uh, faculty position, but, but she was very active, mm -hmm. and uh, the kids got into it. So it was, it was, it was a great experience. That's great. So at that stage, whenever you 
did become provost, were your, were your children already Purdue students? Uh, so 2010, I think one was, um, our oldest was probably done. She was okay. done. Um, we had, I had a son here, mm -hmm. and he was in his, uh, it might have been his junior year. Um, Catherine, our third, I don't think it started quite yet, but she, she did at that point. Um, now let me think about that. No, she was a freshman, I think. Okay. And then, and she had transferred. She she was the only one of the four that didn't actually start at Purdue. She started mm -hmm. at DePaul, but oh, one see. semester later she transferred. And then Haley f um, started uh, two two and a half years ago okay. as an undergrad. So Catherine's still here working on her uh, second degree nursing. Mm -hmm. She finished her bachelor's, and then she'll be done in August uh, of this year. Um, and then Haley. Uh, has a year and a half left in her bachelor's, okay. but yeah, they were they were full and that they were very valuable. Every they were my spies. Every right. Sunday they came <laughs> home and told me, "Okay, mm -hmm. you got to fix this, or this is going well, but this is happening and you don't know about it, and you got to you should look at it." So they they were they were really good about that. It's fascinating that they were so aware of areas of the university, you know, that you could get involved with actually improving. I mean. I think sometimes there's a perception that students are kind of in their own world, and it seems like they were kind of taking a holistic approach to they, looking at they it. They had their eyes open, but uh -huh. most of what they were telling me was what their personal experience was, and then you could you could kind of from that figure out what was going on from the you know from the little broader perspective. I see. So it wasn't that they were actually out there being spies for me; it was more that they were just feeling free to tell me what was going on and. Right. and and it was it was very it wasn't that you know I took any action on person and individuals or anything it wasn't that it was about uh, more about what kinds of programs and environment we were creating for the students and whether mm -hmm. it was uh, working or not and so that was very valuable. That's terrific. That's really great. Well, I know that um, we don't have a lot more time, so I'm going to skip down to a few other questions. Um, after President Cordova left, you served as acting president mm -hmm. for approximately six months. Mm -hmm. How did your life change during those that time? Well, that was a pretty big change for us because um, that was another surprise. I didn't expect that. I remember telling the, uh, Mike Berghoff, who was uh, chair of the search committee and, and the board members, that I would um, do whatever they needed me to do. I, if they wanted me to be provost, that's fine, acting, interim, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, just let me know and I'll I'll keep doing what I'm doing and uh, the conversation over a period of months kind of evolved and um, and then when then they told me that I was going to be either acting or interim and they didn't know for how long mm. so okay well that we better start preparing for this mm -hmm. um, then a few weeks later it became clear that Mitch Daniels was going to be the the president and then it became very clear how long and that was six months because of the oh, of course. they announced mm -hmm. in the end of Francis term and then then it was about six months till the end of his second term as governor mm -hmm. and till January of 2013 so um, when that was yet another conversation with the family because that, that was even more exposure more it was a different role and um, a huge commitment for for Laura because my wife because there's no way you, you can pretend not to be the you can pretend that well this is just six months and Mm -hmm. acting president we don't need a first spouse but that's not the way right. that the community sees it and they adopted her and she adopted them and she got mm -hmm. very involved and so it was a great it was a great time but that's when uh, I realized that um, that one option could be a un being a university president or chancellor mm -hmm. that that wasn't a crazy thing for me to do mm -hmm. and, and it was um, rewarding uh, and when you go from provost, there's no guarantee. Provost's job is nothing like the president's. The only mm -hmm. thing that's similar is that you have to learn, you have to really understand the institution as people, but you're not really doing, they're almost complementary jobs. Mm -hmm. And so there's no guarantee that if you're an effective provost, you're going to be an effective president or chancellor. And I certainly had those doubts, but, but um, as we got into it, we enjoyed it and realized, okay, well, this, you can have even more impact in this role. And, right. And so that, that really opened my eyes to the fact that um, that was something I, I could think about mm -hmm. in the future. It didn't, I didn't have to do that, but that was something that might, might work. Um, but it was a great, great period. We really enjoyed that six months. Everybody was, you know, we got to know parts of the university that 
that most faculty don't see. Mm -hmm. Certainly the, um, the relationship with the state, the um, intercollegiate athletics, uh, the relationship with our donors and friends, um, all those things are the most important in terms of the time and effort you have to put into this. And um, I enjoyed all of it. So, and I didn't know I would. And um, it wasn't all easy, but, but I, and fun. That's not, it, a lot of it was tough, but, but uh, it was rewarding. Well, did you have any input on the selection of the president when you were in the acting president role? No, no, I, I didn't want to and I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I was basically there, you know, if they had asked me, do you want to be president, I would have said, yeah, I'll think about it. Um, right. But but it really was pretty clear where they were, they were headed to a okay. acting interim situation. And, uh, and this was an unusual opportunity. You know, there aren't too many Mitch Daniels out there. and. Right. And this one just uh, clicked for the trustees in the search committee. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so they basically told me I had a one-year kind of deal, six months as acting president, and then they asked me to stay at least six months just to um, make sure that the transition went well. Oh, yes. And because I had some institutional knowledge at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, it, and I had talked to Mitch, I think I met him in April of 2012 for – we had a three-hour breakfast at one point mm -hmm. before he was a candidate, just to kind of see, what, well, could we work together? Is that something that if if he were to be a candidate, is this would this work? Mm -hmm. And um, I think we both agreed, yeah, this this would work. So um, the board um, wanted me to commit to a year, six months acting for six months back as provost, and I did. And they've been great about. I mean, the the intent wasn't, oh, you got to leave in, at the end mm -hmm. of that year. It was. Um, we we'll kind of want you around that long, At and then least that long. we'll see what yeah. happens. And uh, that was my thinking as well. I didn't mm -hmm. have any desire to jump ship. It was going well, but but uh, when you, I was told by the board members as well as others that if you're acting president for six months like that, you've got enough exposure that you're going to end up on the um, short lists or at least the the lists of people who are called by the search firms mm -hmm. and we had it happened that cycle we had 16 um, positions open at the chief executive level wow. at universities uh -huh. and that in that period that followed my return to the provost position there were a few that in in the midst of that but there, there were that cycle was there were a lot of open positions that yeah. the pool apparently wasn't very deep they they really uh I think all those institutions struggle a little to find the right people, and uh, most of them are settled. There's still a few that aren't, but uh, the Virginia Tech thing just resonated from the beginning. I had a conversation with them in August, mm -hmm. uh, so after I returned to pro as provost, I didn't take it too seriously, but then they kept contacting me, and I kept engaging them, and mm -hmm. as we went further and further into it, it became uh, apparent that, you know, we saw things the same way and then mm -hmm. it, my vision for their institution was almost the same as or if not identical to their vision for it and that that's pretty rare that you yeah, can have that absolutely. kind of a, a match and um, so it w worked out beautifully well um, I want to make sure that I give you time to put anything on the record you'd like to add and I I'm okay I've got you know I, I can go another five minutes or yeah five? sure okay, oh yeah perfect. five or five or ten um, well, I was curious, what, what's an aspect of your current position that you particularly enjoy? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, the, the one thing that, that I enjoy about doing any of these administrative uh, positions, um, you, you're really in a service role, and you've got to keep that mentality. It's not about being the, the one who directs the show. It's mm -hmm. about um, really inspiring others and trying to lower barriers. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like if, if I'm in a meeting with, with faculty or students or alums or whatever it may be, my job is, is to raise people's aspirations, to make it a little, take where they are and try to, try to help them get a little higher. And, um, and that is a lot of fun. It doesn't matter what hat I'm wearing. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I really enjoy doing. Well, I know that um, in one of the thing, the news articles I read, whenever you were first brought to Purdue, 
um, I can't remember who made the statement, but they talked about your strengths, and one of those was collaboration. And I have, in, in the time that you've been provost, frequently overheard other people mm -hmm. make that statement about how well you work with others. And I was curious about um, what it was like for you whenever you had to present a change that needed to be implemented to the faculty or something particularly um, controversial that maybe the university needed to go a particular direction but you knew it wouldn't be easy to mm -hmm. um, bring the faculty along. How, how did you approach those situations? Well, I mean, I, not always well, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I learned. One of the things I learned, and I've told this people this many times because it's such a stark um, lesson that, that when I first started as provost, I, I looked at the org chart, which is a mistake, and I thought, well, it looks like if I talk to all the deans and I get them on board, and then if I can get the uh, university senate leadership on board, that covers everybody. <laughs> but that, that isn't the way it works. Uh -huh. You have to go and talk to the people who are really doing the work or are really involved, and uh, that may be the faculty, it may be the students, it may be the staff. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of engagement's critical. Um, probably the best thing um, I, I did which uh, was an idea that uh, Vic Lechtenberg, uh, the um, interim provost when I was, or acting provost when I was acting president, mm -hmm. um, did is have uh, regular meetings with faculty, just kind of randomly chosen faculty. They, they self-select. And um, those are the, that's where you really learn what's going on. And that's where you, if you have something you would like to push forward and see if it has legs, uh, mm -hmm. that those are the kind of venues that, and you just have to do a lot of that. Um, and be open, don't get defensive, don't push things harder than, than you can mm -hmm. realistically expect to be able to push them. Once in a while, you know, you, you have what you think is a brilliant idea and people just don't get it or don't wanna do it and, and some, some of those you just have to let them go. Others are, are too important to just let go and you just keep plugging away and, mm -hmm. and trying different angles and, and at the same time, that's one route. The other route is that the faculty or the students come up with an idea, and my job is to help sell it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's almost a daily activity, and it's done, it really is done in the trenches. It's not, you know, once in a while a letter to the campus or, or a speech or something has an impact, but, mm -hmm. but that never is enough. you you got to keep working it. Well, do you think um, the fact that you kind of started as an, a faculty member too here at Purdue and worked your way up. Did that have any influence, do you think, on how the other faculty saw you whenever you became provost? Oh, I'm sure it did, and that was what France was looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no question about that. Yeah. Whether I deserve that to be treated as a faculty member most of the time, I don't know, but I, I, um, I still, you know, it still happens where I get in an email conversation with someone or a in-person conversation with faculty mm -hmm. and they're confused about whether to treat me as the provost or their faculty colleague and mm -hmm. that's a good we, we often go back and forth on that well you know as provost this is what I think we ought to do but you know they, they're they're uh, that I still feel very connected to the faculty um, whether they feel that way or not is I don't know but but I, I think that um, that connection is really important well, I just have one more question for you, and that is, what, what do you consider your proudest moment or your, your greatest accomplishment during your entire tenure at Purdue? Entire tenure at Purdue. Well, um, you know, I get that question often, and I always give different answers. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's your favorite answer What am today? I feeling today? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think the probably the thing that jumps out for me is the thing that is probably the least baked at the moment, and that is um, this project we're doing called Purdue Next, which um, I didn't invent it. It it was it grew out of some work going on in nanotechnology, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I really became a proponent for it and wanted, and worked on spreading it through the university and and becoming um, and working on the model with others, um, including Anath Agarwal, who's the um, or Anath Iyer. <laughs> Not the Iger Walls, a different person. Mm -hmm. Anant Iyer, uh, who's a faculty member in management here. Okay. And um, he, uh, he is leading this project. And a matter of fact, that's where I'm headed in 10 minutes is to go thank the faculty who've been involved. We've had faculty create 25 different modules. These are online uh, courses, but they're not tr 
typical online courses, they're heavily into simulation, computation. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to use the the digital environment where it's most valuable, which is creating environments, learning experiences that can't be created in a regular classroom. Mm -hmm. So you can always, if you're just recording someone talking, that's not, that, that is, it has a role, but that's not special in the sense that it's, it doesn't take advantage of the digital capabilities. Right. And so we've been working on this um, model and it's, I think it's going to catch. It's still early days, but, but um, I really feel that that is the right way to go for a lot of reasons. And um, so I feel good about that. Another, and that hasn't sort of risen above the radar horizon yet, but, mm -hmm. it, but it will, I think. Mm -hmm. um, impact, which I didn't start, but I, I really feel um, connected to, is this course transformation project that uh, Dale Whitaker, um, Frank Dooley, uh, Chantal uh, Levesque-Bristol, um, and several others have been just instrumental in making happen. But mm -hmm. this is cohort model where you bring the faculty in and they want to transform the course and we bring all the resources to them rather than have them have to find them. Right. And I think that's the, the key to course transformation is having the faculty, empowering the faculty to do it rather mm -hmm. than telling them, uh, we'll help you when you find us. Um, I, I, think, I think that's a really great program and, and has gone on for a few years and will continue to grow. Um, I feel good about where we, we've turned a corner with international students. I think we, we certainly have had a huge influx of international students, and I feel good about that, except for that we weren't really ready from an inclusion point of view. Mm -hmm. and we didn't, we, you know, we, we weren't really ready in terms of um, the classroom environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's still a lot to do, but we've made a lot of progress in getting to that point where we're going to be able to say to, honestly to international students, not only will you come here and get a great education, you'll actually be be a part of the campus. This will be your your home, oh, and, that's uh, great. and I think we're not there, but we're we've done a lot to get there, and I, I feel good about that in terms of momentum. Uh, every year, we've had a, a higher profile of uh, incoming student by any measure, and um, we've gotten the uh, first to second year retention up above ninety percent for three years in a row. Yeah. So I feel good about it. Never been it had never been that high at Purdue, and I. I that you need to be above 90 percent to have any chance of having a graduation rate that's somewhere around the 70 80 percent range 75 80 percent range mm -hmm. we're at about 71 right now but there's a six-year lag so oh. I, I you can already see the four-year graduation rate screaming up and mm -hmm. uh, second to third year is uh, retention is going way up so i feel good about the attention we paid it wasn't my tenure exact you know that, that started it it started um, under randy and france they, mm -hmm. they seeded it, said we're going to pay attention to the undergraduate experience, but we really piled on for the last mm -hmm. uh, four years, and um, we're starting to see the impact of that. Our Absolutely. graduation rates are going to start, the six-year graduation rate will start going up. It started going up this year, but it will go up significantly. Four years up uh, almost, I think, 47 percent. It was, I think when I started, it was around 38 or so, and, it, mm -hmm. and that, that needs to get up there well above 50. Um, so I feel good about that. I think um, the kinds of students we're attracting, the new honors college, uh, we're really, I think, attracting the best students in Indiana and, and, and quite a few from outside Indiana. Uh, I think Purdue's in great shape from the standpoint of the undergraduate experience. This, the Third Street Corridor, Student Success Corridor is almost done. And mm -hmm. um, I think uh, when, when we have the new library building, which I'm really proud of, the fact that we got the money for that um, last year um, in the budget cycle. Um, that's the Active Learning Center. Um, I'm excited about that starting up this summer. Um, so there, there's lot to be, lots to be uh, happy about, lots of challenges, but it was a, it, it, it was a good uh, almost four years and I couldn't have predicted what would have happened, but uh, I'm pretty pleased with it. Another area that I think is really important for Purdue is um, cluster hiring or interdisciplinary hiring. We've mm -hmm. been doing quite a bit of that, and uh, I, th I think that's, um, that's where we get our strength, especially at the graduate level. It does seem like all of, there are all of these various areas that have been worked on to kind of improve the whole, which I know one of the big issues is affordability as well as the value of education. Mm -hmm. and. 
Um, I certainly have seen in my time here a lot of improvements with things like impact and mm -hmm. learning spaces. So it is a very exciting time. And um, I know that you are going to make the same transformations at Virginia Tech. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, I appreciate it.